uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, Paul asked me to uh, do this talk on short notice, and uh, he specifically asked that I talk about microtubules again because uh, it brought up so many questions last time this topic was brought forth. So uh, I tied it into a rather current topic, uh, which is the, the latest uh, that has occurred in the press with regards to uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking. And uh, Dr. Hawking is a noted uh, brain, as I think anyone will admit. But, uh, you know, sometimes his, his thoughts and his philosophies uh, uh, are kind of out of his field, and I'm going to propose that this is one of them. And so, for some of you who can't read, is there anybody who cannot read from the screen? Yeah. Okay, then I'm going to read, read what's on there. So this is one of his latest quotes which uh, went all across the world and he says, quote unquote, one can imagine such technology outsmarting financial markets, out inventing human researchers, out manipulating human leaders, and developing weapons we cannot even understand. Whereas the short term impact of AI depends on who controls it, the long term impact depends on whether it can be controlled at all. Okay? Now, I am not a neuroscientist, but almost all research that's done on artificial intelligence uses mathematics at its base. So that's why you're hearing me talk on this, and I am going to talk from the position of a mathematician, which means that I'm going to have an opinion. Uh, you may not agree with it, and, and that's fine. Uh, there is so much about this field that nobody really understands, and that's going to be one of my major points. Uh, there are two noted voices in artificial intelligence uh, who are neuroscientists, one way or the other. One of them is uh, Google's Kurzweil, and uh, he says that even though most of the people in the field think we're still several decades away from creating a human-level intelligence, he puts the date at 2029, less than 15 years away, in which machinery, inte artificial intelligence, supersedes human intelligence. <laughs> now, this is one, uh, what I consider one of the foremost authorities on intelligence. Uh, this is a book written by Jeff Hawkins. I've read it several times. I consider it one of the chief pieces of research ever done on the whole topic of intelligence. And here is one of the main quotes out of the book, which is one of the premises that I'm going to be operating on today. And Hawkins says, as opposed to Stephen Hawking, the United States alone has thousands of neuroscientists, yet we have no productive theories about what intelligence is or how the brain works as a whole. Most neurobiologists don't think much about overall theories of the brain because they're engrossed in doing experiments to collect more data about the brain's many subsystems. And although legions of computer programmers have tried to make computers intelligent, they have failed. I believe they will continue to fail as long as they keep ignoring the differences between computers and brains. Now, Hawking's is one. Uh, Jeff Hawkins is one of the most successful and highly regarded computer architects and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. He is the uh, founder of, the, of Palm Computing, which invented, he invented the handspring and the Palm Pilot, which now has morphed into the cell phones that you are carrying in your pocket. Uh, he founded Palm Computing and uh, created the, the Redwood Neuroscience Institute to promote research on memory and cognition. Now, uh, what is particularly interesting here is the reason why Hawkins became a neuroscientist was for the purpose of creating artificial intelligence. And when he got into the ins and outs of how the brain actually works, he became one of the foremost authorities he knows more than almost all medical people in the neuroscience field. And he has consequently discovered, since this book first came out in 2004, 
that most of the research done on intelligence has been done in a mathematical arena. Numbers telling us what intelligence is. And because of that, there is almost no agreement on what intelligence is in the scientific community. So, here is what are the chief discoveries that he made on the, this topic of the difference between brain, the brain and computers. First, the human mind is created not only by the neocortex, but also by the emotional systems of the old brain and by the complexity of the human body. To be human, you need all your biological machinery, not just the cortex. The second problem we have to overcome is connectivity. Real brains have large amounts of subcortical white matter. As we noted earlier, the white matter is made up of the millions of axons streaming this way and that just beneath the thin cortical sheet, connecting the different regions of the cortical hierarchy with each other. An individual cell in the cortex may connect to five or 10,000 other cells. This is not going to work for a brain-like memory system where millions of connections are necessary. Silicon chips and white matter are not very compatible. <laughs> now this is more significant than hardly anyone realizes. So if you take what the human brain does with regards to connecting to all the other brain cells, and <clears throat> you will find that I will not even limit uh, our human capability to the brain cells. But even if you do limit to the brain cells, in order for a computer to accomplish what we do naturally, you would have to have a computer with cables going from memory point to memory point that literally would cover the United States in copper wire. Okay, all right, Hawkins, major significant point. Computers have memory too in the form of hard drives and memory chips. However, there are four attributes of neocortical memory that are fundamentally different from computer memory. One, the neocortex stores sequence of patterns. This is no small matter. Computers store data. Brains do not. And this was one of his major findings. And you know, this was over 15 years ago. And many, many medical people still don't realize this. The brain does not store memory. It stores patterns. OK? And in so doing, it then comes out that this whole notion of storing patterns does not work the same way as storing memory in a computer. In storing memory in a computer, you use bits and bytes. The brain doesn't do anything remotely similar to that. So this is a major factor in this whole discussion of quote-unquote intelligence. Secondly, the neocortex recalls patterns auto-associatively, which means there is something in us in which these patterns moving in the conscious and the subconscious can do so without our even knowing that they're happening. Now, how would you come up with a similar model with a computer? Okay. Thirdly, the neocortex stores patterns in an invariant form. I'm just going to leave that. The neocortex stores patterns in a hierarchy. I'm going to leave that also because that gets into the highly technical and I don't think we need to go there right now. And lastly, the patterns are stored holographically. In research that was done with rats, where they took a rat that did not know how to get through a maze, they wired the rat up, 
and attached the electrodes to the rat's brain and then taught the rat how to get through the maze. So what they were going to do afterward was to use uh, electrodes to kill part of the rat's brain to find out where this memory was stored. All right. So they would run the rat through the maze, then destroy part of the brain to see if it would forget how to run through the maze. So they did this several times. It turns out that the only way they could get the rat not to know how to go through the maze was to destroy the entire brain. Okay, so computers store data, brains store patterns. This is no small matter. <clears throat> One of the most prominent scientists now who is causing a complete uproar in the scientific community is Roger Penrose, who is a mathematical physicist and who is currently working with many people, but among them is Stuart Hameroff, an MD. So Penrose wrote a, a groundbreaking book called The Emperor's New Mind, which caused an uproar with the artificial intelligence community. So Penrose hypothesizes that quantum mechanics plays an essential role in the understanding of human consciousness. The collapse of the quantum wave function is seen as playing an important role in brain function. Now for any of you who do not know what the jargon means of the quantum wave function collapsing, in our lingo we use the word manifest. This is how reality actually works. Okay? We make reality. Penrose grants that we may be able to artificially construct what he calls conscious intelligence, interesting term, and such objects can succeed in actually superseding human beings, but he thinks algorithmic computers are doomed to subservience. Okay? Now, algorithmic computers uh, in mathematics and algorithm, uh, an, an easier word to use is formula. Almost all AI is based upon uh, uh, formula-like programming instructions, okay? And Penrose is saying the brain goes way beyond this, that the brain has the capacity to move at a quantum mechanical level. And I'll come back to this. Penrose's argument is twofold. First, he shows why human type intelligence could not be implemented by an artificial intelligence using the Turing machine equivalent computer, a very technical term in mathematics, uh, ordinary parallel neural or otherwise. Then he shows how it could be physically possible that the human mind can be al algorithmic in this sense. Uh, in ordinary language, He's basically saying that there's something affecting intelligence, not intelligence affecting something else that we call human, okay? And finally, the quantum mind or quantum consciousness hypothesis proposes that classical mechanics cannot explain consciousness. Well, quantum mechanical phenomena such as quantum entanglement and quantum superposition may play an important part in the brain's function and could form the basis of an explanation of consciousness. Which gets us into the main topic for me. <coughs> Microtubules, okay? So Penrose and uh, Hameroff, uh, who is an anesthesiologist, and uh, got into this whole topic of consciousness because he wanted to find out why people lost consciousness uh, under anesthesia.